Cause I'm Zaka Khan, I wanna come and fight for Allah Gonna send them through the fire, Shaka Khan, I'll cry for mama <laughs> What's up everyone, I'm Matt Forio, and in honor of my hair not being able to be tamed, and Julius Caesar's angry little boy haircut, we're gonna keep the hair down today. It's Mr. T versus Mr. Rogers. It's Washington versus Wallace part two. No, it's Caesar versus Zulu. I've never heard of Shaka Zulu, and I think that it's kind of important for ERB to do things like this where they have obscure characters. This battle works as an installment to the series, not the business. Obviously it's a contribution to the business, but this heavily added substance to ERB as a series. Taking two less requested or obscure characters and pitting them against each other based on their roots. Not as much fan service here as there is heritage service. You know how I like to compare all the other ones in this storm to the current one that I'm chiseling? So let's Let's do it again here. Lewis and Clark versus Bill and Ted. Self-service. Pete and Lloyd grew up loving Bill and Ted and wanted to recreate them with the stuff that they're privileged with. Houdini vs. Copperfield, service to a specific fan base. There's people who request video games, TV shows, movies, etc. And there's always going to be people who are going to request magic. They try to put everything in here that anyone would ever want for magic as a nod to them being in the audience. Terminator vs. Robocop, fan service. Highly requested battle. They know they will please many fans, especially younger ones. East vs. West, me service. <laughs> but service to the thinking audience, the analysts. And this one, heritage service. Respects and outlines two heritages and styles of leading people in both government and battle. And it analyzes the tactics throughout, and you'll see that as we progress through the lyrics. What's next? What service are they gonna do next? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not in cahoots. It didn't have anything too drastic going on with it, story-wise. Just a battle of ideology and method and culture. And looking at it this way makes some sense as to why certain things were included and or left out of this battle. So let's jump right into the lyrics this time. Conan of the Savannah implies that Shaka and his crew are barbarians, a group of wild savages who eventually contributed to the fall of the Roman Empire. This starts a string of connections of Shaka acknowledging that, in Caesar's eyes, he is a barbarian, like most of Rome's enemies. Regardless of what institution Shaka is actually native to, he will further be generalized to be associated with Germans and the barbarians. If you listen closely, all of the A sounds in this part are elongated to create some type of an exhaling chorus throughout the lines. When Shaka fights, he uses a hammer instead of his hands. When I fight, I use a chisel. He is placing brute force on top of tacticians and strategy. Basically, tools over hands. And to go ham is slang for vigorously performing well. Continuing the analogy of Shaka being a barbarian, specifically among the German enemies of Rome, the next section parodies the Romans' humiliating effort to conquer German territory. Germans thwarted the Romans in their tracks, and beheaded someone in the process. When the Germans topped off the head of Roman General Varus, they literally sent it to Rome, probably with expedited shipping. Coincidentally, the head was delivered to Augustus, Caesar's son. As a reference to pivotal points in Roman history, Shaka threatens to repeat this incident. However, he will send Caesar's head back to Rome, not concealed in bubble wrap, but wrapped in a banner, specifically the banner that represents Caesar's legions. Each legion is known to have a corresponding flag and known as a Bexalum. I don't want to give you a full history lesson, but the reason why this line is solid is that Shaka makes a reference with the word dome that acts as a platform to another reference coming in the next line. Dome has two meanings, one being someone's head or noggin, and the other being the structural rooftop of common Roman architectural design. This can get deeper the more you think about it, maybe deeper than they intended. And that's why the seeds that ERB plants with their lyrics harbor such longevity and memorability. Dome can be stretched to another meaning, meaning the head of the empire. Here we have a head and here we have a body. This is the state of Rome. When we're looking at it this way, this is the ruler, which would be Caesar. The arms and the legs would be the militia. And everybody in here are the constituents. If Caesar would be beheaded, then literally the head of the state would be beheaded and the state would be without leadership. The head of both the leader and the head of the state would be wrapped in a banner, and when one's banner or flag is captured, the army ceases to function. Shaka will take their banner, wrap the head of the leader and of the entire state in it, and literally give his token of victory back to them, saying, 
Try again, better luck next time. Set up your flag again so I can go capture it again. Respect. The next line is so simplistically humorous. This reminds me of a rap battle that you see on the street, when two people are just getting started and using raw direct punchlines like, Alright, alright, I'm Shaka Zulu. If you try to rap with me, this will happen to you. Uh, and instead of the crowd blowing up after the punchline, this crowd actually says the punchline. And what's funnier than 100 plus copies of a Viner participating in the same type of obvious humor that he's famous for? It's a nod to the simple rhyme scheme that the word Zulu has. They're not going to manipulate it, but they are going to make a subtle threat that parodies the easy rhyme scheme of the word. You cross that equator, you head straight into a massacre. It is imperative to make note of the geographical differences between these two rappers. They are against each other for multiple reasons, and when acting out what could plausibly be a real-life conflict, real-life scenarios must be implemented. Geographically, the Roman Empire never saw territory south of the equator, and the Zulu Empire was confined to a small landmass that never encroached on the northern side of the equator. The equator acts as a literal mediator between the two fighters, and the two colonies and lifestyles. We see it in the side shot, which is a necessary angle to distinguish where these people are, and the differences in landscape. Normally, we see a vertical border portraying the rappers as being in two different places, but this borderline, or the makeshift equator, travels on a vector that gives a perspective of not only distance in the background, but existing on the same plane. It's a fantastic aesthetic that gives us a break from seeing two different people from what is supposed to look like two different cameras. It feels like they're literally going head to head, like they can reach out and grab the other one. <laughs> First of amazing connections between the two rappers. You cannot only include lines that diss the other character on what is native to them personally. The two are battling for a reason, and that reason opens up doors to connections between the two and obscure similarities. This being the first, Cleopatra was Caesar's lover. To F someone means to join and encoy this with them, or to destroy them, mess up their day. This line doesn't need explaining, it just needs praise. It's a line that, after it's written, looks like it wrote itself, but the thought needs to be there. The connections need to be analyzed, and most importantly, it needs to be executed properly. It's the phrasing that makes this line so powerful. It doesn't just say, you screw Cleopatra and I'll screw you worse, and it also doesn't say, come to Africa and I'll screw you up like my name was Cleopatra. It ties in multiple references just by the way it's worded. I have seven of these listed, so I'll read them off. One, it dunks on the layup from the earlier line. If he crosses the equator, he will be in Africa, and therefore he is able to be screwed by two different people who live in Africa. This is not the only time in this battle that a reference is not shoved in the wrong place of the puzzle. The grooves perfectly fit, as the line before proposes the situation to happen, and it's not just placed there. By being across the equator, he will get screwed by two people in Africa. Two says that Shaka will screw him over. Three mocks the relationship with Cleopatra. Four contributes the short A sound of Cleopatra with Massacre and Africa. Cleopatrica. <laughs> the F word and the word just decorates the interior with internal rhyme. Six, it doesn't just compare something. I love comparisons, comparisons are awesome. But Shaka can't compare himself to Cleopatra. The way that he words it produces the same diss, but doesn't lower Shaka's standards to anyone like Cleopatra. And seven, it makes use of ERB's privilege and vulgarity. They can do whatever they want. They don't need to censor anything. This is a problem with me, because even though I make these videos for you, in terms of a career, unnecessary profanity doesn't need to be the cherry on top of my already obscure content. ERB is big enough to not need other careers. And since they're famous, even if they were to look for another career, curse words being in the thing that they're famous for doesn't really make it a crutch. They utilize this privilege to make use of every word in our language as it is at their disposal, and they did not fail to do so here. Talk a lot of shit for a man wearing a diaper. Another example of utilizing the English language. If I were trying to imply that Chaka was overly slandering Caesar, I would use the word trash, crap or another derogatory word that is relevant to either universe. However, we have the dirty S word making an appearance. That complements the outfits worn by the Zulu. Cloth, only where it matters. Diapers are made to intercept, I'll use the word crap, when a baby isn't potty trained. Caesar uses this to outline the barbaric and untamable nature of Shaka, and accuse him of talking trash. The crap shouldn't be coming out of his mouth. That's what the diaper's for. More simplistically, the line says, you're quick to say bad things about me when you're a grown man wearing a diaper. I heard you had poison spit. Where was it in this cipher? Great line. 
As it is a rap battle, it is imperative to make connections to actual rap, not only specifics about the characters. It also acts as a parody of reminding the audience that these two historical figures are actually rapping against each other and not just fighting. Both aspects can be woven together though, as we see here. Zulu warriors used to spit toxins out of their mouth as a method of blinding the opponent. Poison spit is one of those innumerable slang terms for rapping well, and Caesar uses it to mock Saka's rapping ability. Not hearing the poison spit, or good rapping, Caesar questions the validity of such poison spit existing. It complements the line before also, as they both say, you're this, but you do this, or vice versa. Talk a lot of crap for a guy who wears a diaper, you don't spit poison for a guy whose battle tactics include spitting poison. Except they're both worded in a state that is neither direct nor indirect. It's in this perfect state of limbo that exists in rap battling. And I'll talk about this when I make my in-depth how to write video, or book, should I make a book or an audiobook? It doesn't just say, you don't spit poison even though it's your battle tactic, and it also doesn't say, I will foil little boys when I employ my poise deployment, you'll be soiled in your drawers when I'm much forward spitting poison. I wrote this line as an example of how effective it is for ERB to remain in this limbo state, where it's intelligent enough for it to be a really great diss, but evident enough that anyone can listen to it or understand it, hopefully on the first take. Cause all I hear is threats from a brute with no discipline. Another great example of outlining the purpose of this battle. Also, the word brute is the only mention we have of Brutus here, but I'll talk about that later. Caesar is the poised strategist who relies on battle tactics and planning to win in battle. Zulu is a wild strategist who forms a mold for his men to follow, but utilizes it in a barbaric manner with a lack of discipline. The key word being discipline. It is not strategy that Zulu lacks. He created the Bullhorn Formation, which allowed him to seize the land he seized. Caesar also uses a strategy. The difference is in execution. Caesar formed structured legions, and stuck to that structure in a disciplined manner. Zulu formed structures, strangely based on the shape of animals, and they ironically behaved in an undisciplined, untamable manner that animals behave in. Discipline is the difference. And I'm ruling over you like a boot full of my citizens! Here's an example of referencing something that serves a greater purpose other than what the name by itself could do. To reference Italy, we don't say that Caesar fights for Italy, yeah! And we don't say, If a skittish fiend belittles me, I'll get him seized for Italy! We don't want to blatantly represent Italy by its name. It's just where he's from. If any reference about Italy is to be made, it needs to complement a stronger point. And what do we have here? Rolling over you like a booth full of my citizens. Rhyme scheme. Mentions clothing of the character. References popular nickname for home country. More importantly, it says that Caesar has the support of his people, which is the greater point that Italy is used to support. His legions of men are in support of Caesar's tactics. And when Caesar is offended, his men are offended! And he will stomp hard with the brute force of a boot! A boot that is backed by his city! Just like any mainstream rapper needs to reference where they're from at least three times per song. You should take your cow skin shield and hide under it. You're fucking with the most triumphant third of the triumvirate. I'm first to the empire and last of the republicans and hunting you accompanied by legions of my country. Oh. Excellent rhyme scheming here. Instead of explaining what this line says because it's obvious, I'll give you a rundown of how the writing probably went. Triumvirate? Now that's an AWESOME word! I know, right? Hey, Zach. Yeah? Spit out some rhymes for triumvirate and see if we can get anything out of it. Hmm, I'm wondering. Oh, I'm ultimate. Sky's under it? Triumphor... <laughs> okay. Well, we only need one rhyme to have the first syllable. The last three are the most important. All right. Guy's tumbling. <laughs> Ride my grundle, kid. Uh, time's up for him. But dad! My rumble kit. Hide under it. Hide! Like the, the cowhide shield! Oh! Oh, yeah! Okay, now we have the first two quadruple rhymes. We can start doing the internal rhyme after that and slowly trickle out the first part of the quadruple and turn it into a triple, if you know what I mean. Republicans. F***ing with Countrymen. And a child is born. Ask my kid as if I'm just a shit talker, doc, gee, dunk, on the light, boom, shaka, laka. This line promotes Caesar as being above Zulu, in the sense that he's not shooting out threats that he won't hold true to. Earlier in the verse, Caesar says that Zulu is talking crap. But when you switch the words crap talker, it can be defined as someone who speaks of crap or lies. He's saying that his threats are no lies. And Caesar's kidnappers, whom he threatened, would not live to see the day where Caesar backed down on his threat. Because he killed them all. The Doc J is a really cool reference and a cool rhyme scheme. Talka Doc, Dunka Anya, Shaka Laka. And how Doc J is famous for his basketball dunks. And how Boom Shaka Laka is a common basketball commentator phrase normally used in the video games. 
but I didn't know that Doc J's first name was Julius until I researched it. I got the feeling that Doc J was only used for the sake of comparing Caesar to someone who can dunk well. With the amount of connections a line like this proposes, cramming it into one line required eliminating the more obvious aspect of it, thus limiting it to Doc J. This line had so much to say about both sides that, like the Shakespeare line, could have been broken into two. You can add the meaning of making Shaka explode, ergo boom Shaka Laka, and also say that Caesar will implode his strategy with the way that it's driven through force rather than tactics. Call me Doc Julius or dunk a b Make that anger in your strategy go boom shakalaka! But then you're wasting a whole time with a layup with no other connection to the plot other than it leads up to the main disc. So is it okay with the way it is when you compare the pros and cons? Yeah, I wouldn't change it. Tyler, you're nitpicky! Rewind four seconds. I'm giving my thoughts. If you don't understand why, read the title! I thought this line was really good, but just listening to it, my first impression was who's Doc J and why'd they pick him instead of LeBron or Michael Jordan? And if you don't like my alternative, go watch the rap battle! They didn't use it! It's an outlandish reference that requires another layer of thought. See, usually we have the main characters dissing each other directly. In certain lines, we have a character referencing something that's not native to them but can be alluded to them, drawing a connection between that and something that's relevant to both sides, and then dissing the opponent. For example, Shakespeare, the word spear, and the act of shaking the spear, shaking spears. Here we have a reference to one of the characters that's not native to their culture, another of the same reference. Caesar is able to tie Doc Julius with Boom Shaka Laka, tying a connection, and dissing Shaka Zulu. But don't go rattling your sticks at me! If I wanted to shake spears, I'd waggle my biography! This line is obvious, but the connection is what makes it powerful. The name Shakespeare can be dissected into two different words, something rare for a surname to be able to do. And what does Shaka's army do? Fight with spears. What makes it even stronger is that, like Shaka's first verse finisher, there is a layup to the line that accuses Shaka's army of rattling sticks, like untamed infants who are immature and unskilled, like a baby's rattle. Don't impose these childish tactics on Caesar, because he's much more sophisticated, and if he really wanted to shake spears like you do, he could shake Shakespeare, the author of his biography, making Caesar even more prey. I can't believe I didn't think of this as soon as I knew the matchup. I guess I was trying to stay away from thinking about the battle and the leaked audio because I wanted to give a genuine reaction to it. Speaking of which, you can see that I knew exactly what he was going to say almost halfway through that line. If I wanted to shake spears, I'd waggle my biography. And in that moment, I thought, I should make a segment predicting lines about ERB, and then use that as part of the series. Shaka Zulu's real name is Shaka Kazanzaka Kana, and that's gonna be in the battle because of that rhyme scheme, and they might mention Shaka Khan. Look forward to the next one! This is a beautiful line. So far this battle, it's beautifully written. Wonderful connections between multiple layers of heritage, culture, strategies, and personal choices of each character, each with a supporting position and corresponding puzzle piece for it to fit directly into. Both first verses end with a rich connection to both characters. Aspects of each are woven together, Africa with Zulu, Cleopatra living in Africa for Caesar, Caesar's biography being written by Shakespeare, Zulu shaking spears as a tactic. Both introductions to their second verse introduce a callback response to the line that the previous rapper just said. This is how Zulu retaliates to a so far beautifully constructed line. I heard of your play. Tell me, how does it end? Oh yes, you can stop many times by your friend. So Through my multiple analyses of ERB, I have learned to cope with lines that I disagree with. It's not my place to be angry, it's not my place to act sarcastically mad. They have such amazing material and little duds do not justify my wrath. I've heard through the grapevine that Peter respects my ability to act frankly and give them criticism where I think they should have it. I'm not going to make jokes, not acting like I'm above anyone, not acting like I should be the writer. I just want to ask, why? With fluff removed, this line says, I've heard of your play. In the end, you get stabbed many times by your friends. You don't need a rocket scientist to tell you this is nothing but a statement. You need me to tell you why it's out of place. We've seen lines take such creative approaches in this battle so far. I've already discussed them. What we have here is Shaka proposing a form of sarcasm to Caesar. How do we know this is sarcasm? Besides his tone of voice, we have Shaka asking himself what should be a rhetorical question and answering it in the next line. Factually, we have the words, right, tell me, oh yes, which are clear indicators of sarcasm, right. 
Tell me, oh yes. And that's all they are. Right, I've heard of, tell me, oh yes. Roughly 9 out of the 22 words in these two lines are redundant. That's a little more than one third of the whole couplet. Normally, sarcasm is used to falsely promote someone as being something better or worse than what they are. Usually by assuming that the accused person believes whatever the accuser is saying is not true, is true. Sarcasm is the use of irony, and while it is ironic that Caesar was betrayed and killed by his friends, the irony does not occur within the lyrics of the rap battle. In fact, the irony occurred in 44 BC, and was documented in the 1500s by a man named William Shakespeare, who was ever so creatively referenced in the line prior. What we have here is literally Shaka Zulu asking how Caesar's play ends, when he knows the answer and intends to answer it in the next line. What's strange here is that this is set up to be a diss. With the way that the first line is hyped up, it acts like there's a layup to be dunked on. Entirely, there is no real diss in this line. There are three areas of this line where the diss could be evident, but we really don't see it. The first option is, I've heard of your play. What's significant here is that a brutal force and the sole leader of Rome was iconized in a biographical screenplay. Not the most threatening thing to call your own. However, with the rest of the line, it's obvious that this wasn't intended to be the crux of it. It doesn't go on to say how Shaka was fossilized in more iconic writing, or anything related to that, but the part of the line, right, I've heard of your play, acts as a setup to having Shaka rhetorically ask how the play ends. And if you see what I just did there, I consolidated those 12 words into five. How does your play end? Just by adding one word and a possessive pronoun associated to it in the middle of the already existing end of the first line. That's even if you want to keep the line as a question. Could the mockery of Caesar be that he was popularized in the work of a playwright? Yes, and it's possible that that's wholly what they intended. But the rest of our evidence shows that that's not what's emphasized. The second area the disc could lie in is tell me, how does it end? And this area could only be the source of the diss if the following line would parody something, instead of informing the audience of simply what happened. And for this to work, we would need the cooperation of the next line and the third option for where the diss could be. You get stabbed many times by your friends. Is clearly where the diss was intended to come from. But by asking the rhetorical question, you're purposely wasting time being sarcastic and cocky as an intended platform to set up for a harsh diss to follow. That would act as a gotcha question that could not be rebutted. And while it is harsh to point out that Caesar was murdered by his friends, that's literally what he does. This brutalizing diss, the one that Shaka wasted time literally repeating information that we just received in the line prior, in order to build up to, is ultimately revealed as, word for word, you get stabbed many times by your friends. Obviously, it's humorous to point out that Caesar, such a powerful man, ended in such a powerless fray of betrayal. But this line doesn't do that. It just says what happened. Had the rhetorical question been asked and followed up with a joke or a punchline or any other connection besides what appears to be an exact quote from the No Fear Shakespeare Spark Notes version of the screenplay, this would have justified the means for using a rhetorical question and wasting a whole line doing it. For example, I've heard of your play, drama, chick flick, anything. You call those friends? Yes, people who got your back stabbed it in the end. Pe friends got your back? These guys literally have Caesar's back with a knife in it. Yes, you end their play right in that manner. Show how your friends got your back. Stabbers! I offer you a peace treaty. We can be friends. So I can join the cast of gentlemen who stab you in the end. That anything that creatively proposes what actually happened in the story. I have conceded to so many of you who say ERB needs to appeal to a younger demographic so they make easier to get references. Because I understand that part of audience fulfillment. I feel like such a fact statement as we see here is rare to even that lower tier of lyrics we speak of. The rap genius even barely has anything to say about these two lines. Because the line defines itself. The battle has already done so many wonders. In writing lines that are deep enough to be golden, but portrayed in easy enough to get language and reference, that anyone can understand on nearly the first listen. You'll see that this battle, with my reaction, is among the first where I basically understood two lines in full on the first listen, either during or milliseconds after my brain intercepted the line. I've never had that happen so easily before, but ERB pulled off such good connection with this one that it just fit. I just don't know what happened here. And like, if I'm missing something it, like insanely intense and I just wasted 15 minutes explaining why I, I think that with the quality of the lyrics that this just doesn't add up. So what you gonna do with your Roman sword? When the lines of your legion keep going by the horns of the Zulu? Yeah. Play the thorn! You just remember any emperor's pasty white horn! 
Now there needed to be a lyrical analyzation of the structure and strategies of each party, which is what the girth of the middle section of this does, and both parties do this in their second verse. Here, Zulu compares the horns of his formation to what they're actually based off of literal horns, but physically those who would be attacked by the horns would be gored, and literally they would have an angled advantage over the straightforward lions of Caesar's men who all are attacking from the same angle. Shaka was also training his men during his lifetime to fight against armies of white people, and using the contrast in skin color and this fact, Romans can have the adjective pasty associated with it. The strength of a lion and the speed of a cheetah, and everyone knows you're just a chicken Caesar. Shaka uses this line to compare himself to his neighbors or wildlife. Take this line for what you will, but I think there's a little bit of a deeper meaning here. Sure, he compares himself to the earned stereotypes of the superpowers that animals have by saying that he can acquire this inhumane strength. But I think there's also something to be said about spirit animals. African heritage involves associating parts of nature with some spiritual influence. And if Shaka's spirit animals were to be a lion or a cheetah, Caesar's would be a chicken. Obviously a reference to cowardice and chicken Caesar salad. Chickens has more of a meaning too, as they are a domestic and tameable breed, or smaller, weaker, and more feeble than lions and cheetahs, who are natives to the savage wildlife interpretation that Shaka Zulu has on his battle style. The more we see the tame versus untamed theme, the more Julius Caesar and Shaka Zulu appear to be fit to fight each other. More of a stretch but in biblical context, the rooster identifies as a symbol of betrayal because of Peter denying Jesus three times before the cock crow. And that's what we have here with Caesar's friends who betrayed him in the end. And any leader can be accused of betrayal if they have a failure to appeal to their constituents. Caesar, like Zulu did, follows up with the first line of his second verse with a callback to the previous line. Can I be a hyena? Yes, I'm going to laugh. I'll pave roads with the bones of your goat herding ass. Caesar retaliates in a way that, unlike Zulu's retaliation, obliterates the line said before it. Usually a rapper just comes in and resumes fighting where they left off, but Caesar responds to every single aspect of Zulu's verse. Typical of a strategist to leave no angles uncovered. He straight up mocks the belief that Africans have some kind of connections to spirits and animals by requesting if he can be a hyena instead of a chicken. Not only does this make fun of the heritage, but he debunks the entire theory of being spiritually associated with an animal by asking if he can choose his preference. If you're not catching what I'm pitching, Caesar jokingly asks if he can switch what is supposedly universally assigned to him, or earned through strength and training, because he believes that this is a human manufactured connection, and a silly one at that. So silly that he would laugh and cackle like a hyena. So he asks for reconsideration of his wildlife correspondent. This is the correct way to utilize a question in a rap battle. There's a few ways, but this is a new one that I quite haven't seen really. It's not necessarily rhetoric, although he doesn't expect an answer, he provides a reason for asking. And that reason supports the notion that the actual source of the diss is that whatever Shaka Zulu is implying can even be left to question, can even be selected. It should not be something that is decided, rather earned. This line is really a request to a belittled opponent, not really a rhetorical question. Also, this line mentions lions, cheetahs, chickens, hyenas, and goats. Didn't know old McDonald joined the ERB writing crew. No, I'm just kidding. This was a good way to mention wildlife and how military powers decorated the roads with body parts and limbs and etc. to threaten other enemies. Cross my front line to drop back and spank you in the chest and I'll decimate your horn. You cannot fight the best. Let your reserves come at me. My ballistas contact me. Hey, hey, hey. I always keep my whole crew. Caesar's men are ready to aim and fire, except Caesar stops them at the word fire and tells them to remain steady. Why? A planned realization for Caesar is that these men would be much more useful as slaves instead of pavement decoration. He has the power to contain them, so he does not have to reserve to the rash tactics of murder. Caesar is reserved, his hands are behind his back, planning how he will attack, as opposed to Shaka outright flailing and attacking. This is a beautiful setup to yet another line that could have been randomly placed, but is introduced as a perfectly fitting puzzle piece. Cause there's no use in murdering you and your heat. Then you can grow my wheat for me after you're beaten. For those of you who think this line is racist, let me give you a little lecture. I use Rap Genius to cover up all the points of the lyrics that I missed to make sure that you are not ill-informed, trying to give you, my audience, the full story. And I'm assuming that if you think this is racist, you don't even know half of the full story. I'm going to use a direct quote from the Rap Genius user ZXQAOS. Caesar says that instead of killing Shaka and his people, he's going to enslave them and make him work on a wheat field. This was a common technique in Roman war and infrastructure tactics. Instead of slaughtering their rivals, they offered them a chance to join the empire sometimes before even the battle began. Caesar uses the word beaten to mean beaten in the rap and beaten as in whipped to have them enslaved. This line is a personal jab at Shaka as he banned the growth of crops following his mother's death resulting in his assassination. There's one, two, 
three, four references that don't have anything remotely close to do with racism. A fifth reference only exists if you want to pull the race card. First off, Shaka Zulu is African. And it is a part of history that Africans became slaves. But there is no direct reference to Shaka being any one of these slaves that his people would come to be. The slaves that Caesar is referencing are directly from Caesar's side of the story, and how he would enslave his opponents instead of killing them, with no relation to Zulu other than what you want to make it to be. Even if this was a slavery joke, slavery is part of history, and this is epic rap battles of history. It's harsher to reference Caesar being murdered by his friend than it is to tell Shaka that he will enslave him like Caesar did to all different types of people that he battled. Is it subtly hinted that Shaka Zulu may have a relationship with slavery being African? Yeah, but it's part of history. Slavery happened, but guess what? It was abolished in the 1800s in America, where these epic rap battles of history are being created, and most of the audience is. At least in America, slavery is not currently an issue that anyone is suffering under or would be offended by because they're suffering under it. If anyone is still alive that had suffered slavery, and would be offended by this line, someone call Guinness. Your ancestors can have been slaves, but this line does not apply to that at all. It's Caesar's kinds of slaves. He was a slave owner because he enslaved all the people that he beat in battle. That's what this line is about. Racism exists as a manifestation of unnecessary hate directed towards a specific race. Inherently today, all men and women are created equal. The only difference between everyone, even people of the same color, are how their heritage applies to them individually. Nothing in this line is unnecessary hate. There's no color bashing, there's no specific vulgarity associated with those of the same color as Shaka Zulu. But you know where there is specific color bashing? Tasty white hordes. No one is mad about that because it's a fact. It's a difference between the two cultures of the fighters. And Caesar must retaliate to this. Shaka is black, Caesar is white. These are facts. And only the people who think that their births occurring in different parts of the world that would lead them to be born as different colors, who think that that's racist, are the ones who are acting on behalf of racism themselves. This is for fun. This is for history. This is for facts, this is for connections. Except that this is not racist unless you want it to be. ERB does not have any racial prejudice against anyone. I'm not racially prejudiced against anyone. I'm saying that people in the comments have thought that this was racist. And to you specifically, I'm telling you that it's not. Not everyone thinks it's racist. It's racist for me to think that everyone thinks it's racist. So is anyone upset that there was no Etu Boutte joke? Well, I was surprised, but look at it this way. It would have had to be a finisher line. And the ones we already have are good enough. Plus, there's not much more that they can do with the reference other than say it, which is what happened with you get stabbed by your friends. One idea for a line that could utilize the quote in a creative way is this. Shaka Zulu says, You wanna dance with Konana the Sabana, but you know we're glorified warriors. Etu Bruto! Which means, and you are ugly. You can twist the meanings of the words. What it really means is, and you, Brutus, you too betrayed me. As Caesar was Italian, the word brute sounds like the Italian word for ugly, which is bruto, masculine. You take a quote, you make a simple joke about it, to the point where the joke isn't really about what the line says, but it's the fact that the writers were able to use it in a way other than its obvious meaning. It's like a fourth wall joke, similar to the way that they introduced the nevermore line and go ahead make my iPod. Now here's some random things I wrote it down about the aesthetics of the battle. There's a Congo beat in the beginning, Dante probably added all that stuff. Lloyd high fives himself and they look at Caesar, which looks incredibly real. Caesar lowers the book in the back angle. At first I didn't like how they stayed away from obvious jokes like the et tu brute line. And I do feel like there was a whole different thing that Caesar could have introduced to ERB, which is why I saw this battle going in two directions. Both would be a great installment either way, but one option would be to do a Gandhi vs MLK mixed with Nate vs Franklin mixed with Obama vs Romney. We see the men's backups come in and the fact that they are present, they're just there for support. There could have been physical contact between the two, and there could have been a third party to come in and interrupt the battle and could have killed both of them in the way that they were both killed within his verse. Alexander the Great, maybe. Or we can take a Washington versus Wallace approach. A fair game rap battle, same amount of lines for each, back to back to back to back, it ends, and no crazy story points. Just a rap battle. And it did that and it worked well. At the end slate, they formed the formations of the actual battle line. I love that this battle ended in a close up and something that Edison versus Tesla really should have done. Then again, I feel like he should have done a whipping motion like this when he said beaten. I knew that this wasn't a boneless threat, but it did take me a little while to figure out what he meant by a growing wheat and being beaten. Oh, beaten like a slave. 
All people are different when they watch these things. Shaka's costume can't even be discussed because of how creative the costume designer is. She made it from scratch. Suai Lopez, you are an amazing part of the crew. Sees her look extremely worn out. Wrinkles everywhere. That little boy haircut made him look like a guy who was just stuck in his mother's basement for too long and spent all that time manifesting anger to take out on people who acted without discipline. Peter's eyes looked gray most of the time too, which sets this role apart from others. Except that little dance he does. Every character is the same when he does that. The voice is similar to what we've seen too, but there's a difference. See, like things come down here when they make voice like, to start some pandemonium. But here, you don't hear the scratch coming up the throat. The voice sounds like it's scaling up his throat in a cascade of anger that just barely bristles the lining of his esophagus. You can make as many weird faces as you want while recording because you already have the audio at that point. You don't need to recreate that in the video because it's supposed to be natural. The beat includes chanting and bongos where it's proper. You don't hear any of that in Caesar's verse. And with the way that the same triumphant horn sound plays at the end of each verse, you can tell that they didn't just buy this beat and drop it in the timeline. Fuck my boy, just Cleopatra, and I if I wanted to Shakespeare, I'd waggle my biography. <laughs> Everyone knows you're just a chicken season. You can grow my wheat for me after your beat. In closing, this battle was extremely well done, extremely thought out. Outright attacking versus reserve discipline. It knew what it was doing and it was almost a perfect battle. So, there's one more battle left in this storm. And I could have sworn that East versus West was gonna be it. But they must have something up their sleeve that I can't imagine for this last battle. Especially if it's just gonna be a one-on-one. -on -one. It's gotta be, once I know what the matchup is, I will write some lines down. Thanks for watching, this is Chisel Dish. You can subscribe for more. I make my own content too. I have an album coming out, do you believe that? Go look at my rap battles, look at my original songs, because I put all this thought into that as well. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, all of these wars are won by the hands of a chisel. Every single warrior fought with the brute force of a chisel, and that is how we are where we are today. Let's go.